new devastating disease called white nose bat syndrome was recently discovered in 2007 in upstate New York when some scientists were surveying a cave and found that thousands of bats had died over the winter. And among the bats that were still alive, some of them had a white fuzziness around their muzzle, and thus the name white-nosed bat syndrome was first coined. The bat die-offs rapidly spread to nearby caves and mines, and scientists raced to try to figure out the cause of this mysterious disease. Eventually, the causative agent was identified as an unusual cold-loving fungus called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which infects bats during the hibernation period and leads to massive colony die-offs. The way that the fungus kills the bats is not completely understood, but seems to involve a combination of waking the bats up early, which uses up their fat reserves, dehydration, lesions on their skin, and a severe immunological response. The mortality rate of this disease is extraordinary and unprecedented, reaching upwards of 90 to 100 percent for some species. It's been estimated that more than 7 million bats have already died to date, and there are dire predictions of local extinctions within our lifetimes. White nose syndrome has been described as causing the most precipitous decline in North American wildlife in recorded history. Now, since it was first discovered in 2007, it's been rapidly spreading, and by the next winter, it had already reached adjacent states. By 2010, the fungus had been detected as far west as Missouri. This is what it looked like in 2012, and by 2015, right now, disease has been confirmed in 25 states and five Canadian provinces. Now, here, in the state of Minnesota, there are two major places where bats hibernate, the Sudan Iron Mine in the north and Mystery Cave State Park in the south. Now, samples from these locations did test positive for the, for the fungus, but the disease has not yet manifested itself among the bats, but it's only a matter of time, given the rapid spread of this disease. Now, there are many reasons why we should be incredibly alarmed about this catastrophic loss of both bat species and bat numbers. In Minnesota, there are four species of insect-eating, hibernating bats. And the most abundant species is the little brown bat, which unfortunately is also one of the most susceptible species. If you dislike mosquitoes, then you should really love bats. A single bat can eat thousands of mosquitoes in a single night, sometimes up to its own weight or more. They also eat lots of other insects and provide significant pest control for agricultural systems. To help put this in perspective, the loss of one million bats means that up to 1,000 metric tons of insects go uneaten each year. Now at this stage, you should all be asking yourselves what's being done about it. The, the really bad news is that there are no treatments for the bats and there are no good ways to stop the spread of the disease. The fungus is sensitive to some of the clinical antifungal drugs that are used by humans. But the logistics and the ecological consequences of applying these drugs to bats and to bat roost is daunting. There are also only a very small number of drugs that are available for humans for fungal infections. And with the growing rise in drug resistance globally, it would be irresponsible to start using these drugs in the environment. The good news is that there are now a number of groups that are actively working on white nose bat syndrome. And I'd like to tell you about how the research in my lab serendipitously intersected that of the bat world. back one slide. This doesn't work anymore. There. I'm a natural products chemist, which means that I study the chemistry of living organisms, mostly microbes. Natural products are also known as secondary metabolites. And some well-known secondary metabolites that you might be familiar with are compounds like penicillin, nicotine, caffeine, vancomycin. Some of you may be enjoying some of the amazing biological effects of these compounds at this very moment. 
Now, these compounds are all made by lots of living organisms, but microbes are especially good at producing these compounds. Microbes produce them for a number of different reasons. They use them as signaling compounds so that they can, can communicate with other organisms. They use them to bind metals from the environment, and they use them in antagonism. So microbes might produce an antibiotic or an antifungal compound to inhibit the growth of or kill a potential competitor. Now, all of these compounds have evolved to interact with biological systems, and frequently they have activity, activities that are relevant to human health. In my lab, we're interested in trying to find new microbial natural products for treating human infectious diseases, especially those that are caused by drug-resistant bacteria and fungi. And the way that we do this is we collect microbes from lots of different locations, and we bring the microbes back to our lab, grow them up, and we try to purify the active compounds. Now, to choose a place to collect the microbes, we think about places that are relatively underexplored and also places where microbial interactions might be especially important. One of our sites is the Sudan Iron Mine, which is Minnesota's oldest and deepest iron mine, and it extends about half a mile below the ground. Next slide, please. And the lowest level of the mine, next slide, strange salty waters trickle out of boreholes that were drilled by the miners before it was closed in the 1960s. On other levels of the mine, different kinds of metals like copper and iron oxides precipitate out in different pools and streams of water. In all of these diverse locations throughout the mine, microbes are living and growing interacting and antagonizing each other. So we collect samples from these different locations, bring them back to the lab, and we culture individual microbial isolates. One of the first quick tests that we do with these microbes is we grow them on a plate, and then we overlay them with a human pathogen, like MRSA, or E. coli, or a yeast, like, a, like Candida. And we look for zones of clearing, zones of inhibition, suggesting that that microbe produced a compound that inhibited the growth of the pathogen on top. Now, a couple of years ago, a whole batch of these plates became completely contaminated, and they were set aside to be tossed into the trash. I happened to be walking through the lab that day, and I picked up one of these plates, and I noticed that they were completely covered with an aggressive, fast-growing filamentous fungus, and yet, there were still distinct zones of clearing, suggesting that this isolate collection from the Sudan mine was especially good at inhibiting the growth of filamentous fungi. And it was at this moment that we realized that perhaps our work that had been focused on human infectious disease could in fact be applied to that of the bat world. Now, several groups, including ours, are focusing on an approach called biological control which is focused on identifying the natural enemies of a pest or, or pathogen. And it's frequently used in agricultural systems. One well-known example that you may have heard about recently is the release of tiny parasitic wasps that are the natural enemy of the emerald ash borer here in Minnesota, which is an invasive and damaging species. In our research program, we're isolating bacteria and fungi directly from the bats themselves, from bat roosts, and from other locations throughout the mine. And we're trying to find bacteria and fungi that can inhibit the growth of the bat pathogen. We're also especially interested in macroscopic fungi that are found throughout the Sudan mine. So for example, this is one species that I affectionately call the cotton candy fungus. These fungi grow so large that you can see them with your eyes. And what's interesting about these fungi is that not only do they grow on wood that's found throughout the Sudan mine, but they can also be found growing up on the bare mineral surfaces of the mine. And this observ observation might give us some clues about the ways in which we might be able to apply biological control in the future. Now, we're, the last thing that we're considering is the ways that insects use to protect themselves from disease. 
Propolis is a material associated with bees that they collect from plant resins. And they use it to seal tiny holes in their hive, and they also use it to protect themselves from disease. So we wanted to see if propolis could be used to inhibit the growth of the, of the pathogen. So for the experiment, we added spores of the fungus to a small dish, and then we added some propolis in a dish next to it, and enclosed both of these dishes in a larger container and incubated it. And after two weeks, the fungus on the right that's cultured by itself seems to be growing just fine. But the fungus that's grown in the shared airspace with the propolis is significantly inhibited. Now, obviously, we're not promoting the idea of sending huge quantities of propolis into mines or caves. But this simple experiment demonstrates that there are, in fact, natural products that could be used to inhibit the growth of the, of the pathogen. Other groups have recently reported some successes in finding bacteria that directly inhibit the growth of the pathogen. And there are, there's another recent report showing that a bacterium produces a volatile antifungal compound. All these successes together are glimmers of hope that perhaps we can develop a pretreatment strategy or therapeutic for treating white nose syndrome in the future. No, back. Thank you. Now, mosquitoes, corn borers, gypsy moths, these are all major foods of bats. It's been estimated that the, the value that bats provide for agriculture is more than $1.4 billion per year in just the state of Minnesota. So imagine the loss of significant numbers of bats and what that means to agriculture. There will be increased uses of pesticides in the environment, degrading water quality and probably affecting lots of other species like honeybees. Now time is of the essence due to the rapid spread of white nose syndrome. And it's essential that we invest now to prevent further damage to the environment. Now, whichever way you feel about bats personally, love them or hate them, in the big picture, species diversity matters. Everything is interdependent and interconnected. The health of all of our plants and animals has a direct effect on humans, and it's essential that we invest in both research and action to preserve them. Now, I want you to care about macro diversity, the plants and animals that we can see with our eyes. But I want to leave you with the idea that there is hope and promise in the diversity of microbes. In just a single teaspoon of soil, there may be more than a thousand unique, undiscovered microbes that may hold the key to a therapeutic for treating disease in agriculture, in animals, and even in humans. If we can combine the amazing biological diversity provided by nature with the ingenuity and creativity of smart people, I think we have a lot of solutions to look forward to ahead of us. Thank you.